wild man here. For the past three hours, I've been exceedingly satiated. And still, reading religious scripture, meditating, and just peacefully observing the world about me and gently contemplating meaningful things and what I started to ponder was the true nature of being a human being the true essence of the human being we are told is love and if we ask ourselves for veracity of that then we cast our minds back or if we are lucky enough at the moment in time the present then we would be feeling that so when we are experiencing new love or deep love then one of the greatest attributes <coughs> that we embrace is that of honesty. We are explicitly honest to our partners whenever we are engaging because the love opens us up and freezes and we no longer feel insecure, embarrassed, inhibited we are basking in a oneness with our partner and so there's no division there's no divide there's just a unity and so how could you feel embarrassed or be inhibited or withhold something which would prevent you from being whole with your partner and so I would think that's very difficult to do and only the most deceptive of people harbouring the deepest of sinister secrets could do that but I can't help thinking that they wouldn't experience the true emancipation and freedom of love so if we assume that love is in actual fact pure honesty no inhibitions we have no projections to project onto our partner via our biases or from our ego we accept everything don't we we accept everything as being quaint or quirky or interesting or fascinating or beguiling we find all these things stimulating in a positive sort of way and that's the beauty of new love if we can keep that level of love and respect and devotion then without any certainty without any uncertainty we would be basking in the kingdom of God and if over and above that we are healthy so we don't have any distractions from our love we are in perfect physical form and our minds are free we don't have any mentalism going on in an adverse way OCD or schizophrenia or depression or anxiety all these things if we, we have free minds then that also is the kingdom of God and when we are in love and we are moving about and we engage in people we are so forgiving aren't we somebody spills a drink on us someone's discourteous to us someone cuts us up in the traffic someone levels some abuse at us we're just cool it doesn't bother us we let it wash over us don't we and so we are in the kingdom of God this notion of being like children that Jesus 
often stated in the Bible. Truly I say unto you that if you are going to enter into the kingdom of God, you have to become like little children. The attributes of children are imagination, excitement, awe, many positive reflections of human virtue, playfulness, openness. There are no set rules within children. We haven't as yet formed them or have had them impressed upon us. And so, we are more sharing, we're most certainly more endearing and loving, and there's a whole lot of stuff going on. We inquire into the world, what's this, what's that, on and on and on. We're open and inquisitive. Children haven't reached the point whereby they go, that's this and that's that and that's a tree. And, you know, there's thousands and thousands of trees and birds and creatures of all different sorts. The moment we stop inquiring, we exit the kingdom of God. Because if we are numb or disinterested to the world about us, to the quintis Quint, et, quintessence, quintessence, quintessence. What's that word? Quintessence. Huh. Quintessence. You know when you haven't used words for a long time and you haven't seen them written, they slip away. And so, what do we have to do? We have to bring them back again. We have to remind ourselves of these sayings and phrases all that sort of thing and so we clog up our minds of all these things which aren't relevant for the kingdom of God that's intellectualizing the world about us intellectualizing the world about us doesn't take us into the kingdom of God it doesn't allow us to bask within the kingdom of God in actual fact, it barely has any bearing, if any at all, on the Kingdom of God. What has a bearing on the Kingdom of God? Or Beauty. Love. Just to look at the world about you, and just to see it how it is without breaking things down. You see, fortunately, because of myself being a Libra, I'm given to the scales, and I'm given to experiencing polarities, and extending myself deeply into one, and then deeply into the other, and then coming back to the centre. And my left brain lends me to investigating and analysing the world about me because I find it absolutely exquisite, fascinating and it takes me deeper into the nature of God in that God is genius and the more I learn about the genius of God the more I love the natural world and cosmic consciousness. But it can take you outside of the essence of God in one way, whereby we become too involved. Like for instance, because I'm psychoanalytical, then everybody I meet, they become my patient. And I observe them and I study them and I profile them. And I can't not do this. And so I think this is quite an obstruction to falling in love again because you get reminded of attributes that you've seen before and you consider that they're going to snowball into something which would be a detriment to the relationship. You can see personality traits 
that are not conducive to harmony and consideration and you know love and devotion and all these things and so it is said that love is blind and I think we need to be blind I'm not sure whether we can absolutely fall in love like we did when we were teenagers when we're older because we're too aware we've seen too much and you can't unsee it and so you're reserved and you're contemplative and maybe you're judgmental and you're waiting and you are maybe nervous, anxious because you see certain personality traits it's only a matter of time before they become more profound so what I will say about the nature of love and the kingdom of God is that we have to let everything go and it is said in relation to Jesus' teachings that it is better to love God and to be wholly devoted to God but humans being humans we have this love for other people we have the desire for sex and for union with other partners and so whether it's a failing of the human being or not is something that many human beings have to do being a monk or being a nun isn't everyone's bag and so there is forgiveness and acceptance for people who need to engage in sex but then they want to bring about the institution of marriage because okay if you need sex okay if you need companionship other than God okay if you need somebody in your life a human being okay if you want children but the emphasis is that that's all well and good and that's wonderful and beautiful but do bear in mind constantly your connection and love for God because that will enable you to do all the things right by your family, children and loved ones and when you do all these things right which are God's rules and laws and societal rules then we relieve our conscience because if we are not honest if we are not explicitly honest then we harbor deception and that deception will tell us all the time that we are deceptive and we are not honest we are not open we are not free to be ourselves because we are harboring a deception which if revealed would cause us some stress and maybe change the opinions of people around us but this is the chance we have to take we have to take this chance people by revealing our openness and our honesty and allowing the person that has feelings towards us to accept our failings and to appreciate the honesty and to consider that okay we all fail in life but if we bury our failings and we don't address them and we create our shadow and we have skeletons in the closet then we act in a restrictive way because there's so many things that we don't want to speak about there's so many things that we don't want to broach and we'll feel uneasy and want to change the subject and move on how many people do you know that are just not open and free to talk about everything because they're hiding something they're unsettled they're not free and they don't have the kingdom of God because you can't have the kingdom of God people if you are harboring deception and secrets and negative thoughts so the whole premise of the kingdom of God is to 
be in love with God, with cosmic consciousness, with the world, with people, with things. To be completely honest and open so we don't harbour any negative energies, any demons. We are kind, loving, trustworthy and we exhibit justice, the notion of justice. And of course, forgiveness plays a very important role. So what I've discovered in my life, that when they say that the truth will set you free, it most certainly will. And I've always been explicitly honest. And it's been often quite perturbing to some people. Because they could never be that honest. And they wonder if they told you some of their secrets, whether you would reveal them. So they feel insecure about your honesty because they could never meet you and match you with that. So they hide things from you. And you know when we're growing up and we're talking to our friends and associates and we're telling stories and then we say, what about you? Have you ever had any of these scenarios? What about you with girls or guys? There must have been some really embarrassing situations that you're just cringing and wish the world would open up and swallow you. But how many people are prepared to reveal those truths and to leave themselves vulnerable? Not many. And so all these things prevent you from being in the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, people, is a mind of innocence, like a child. Then, the kingdom of God is also an explicitly honest state of being. Kind, loving, generous, helpful. All these things, because when we do all these things, we become free. We free ourselves. And so, by freeing ourselves, we free our mind, we free our bodies of the stress which pertains to the thoughts, and we enter into the best possible condition of being a human being. And that's the Kingdom of God. That is the Kingdom of God that Jesus spoke about. Truly I say unto you, the Kingdom of God is within you all. Truly you will not get into the Kingdom of God unless you become like little children. And so when we look into all these sayings and metaphors and we understand the richness of those sayings, the truth will set you free. You have to let it all out. This is why Catholics go to confession. I've done confession with myself. I've done confession before God. And in an instant, your mind is relieved of that energy. You are in actual fact free. I've looked into it. I've looked into prayer. I've looked into faith. I've looked into all these connotations relating to Christianity, and freedom, and God and love. I've looked deeply into them all. And I was told by Jehovah that everything is love. And it most certainly can be if we eradicate the negative energies from within us, if we let them all go. The Buddhist tenet of non-attachment, attach yourself to nothing. Let it all go. Be explicitly honest. Let it all go. Be open and loving and unreserved to show your love and tenderness and devotion. And then when you're like that, the universe opens up for you. And it fills you with the Kingdom of God. And so that's why, potentially, the Kingdom of God is within you all. And most certainly when we become like children and we regain a new enthusiasm for the world. A new awe. 
We stop labelling everything we come upon and dismissing it. We look closely. We look at the tiniest little thing. And just like fractals, we see more and more and more and more. And it never ends. It never ends. So when you bear all these things in mind, and then, of course, you are emancipated. You have to be free. You cannot be owned. You cannot be in a relationship where somebody owns you and dictates to you and has so many expectations of you. You cannot be in a situation whereby you have to work. You have to, to slave away. You have to... Uh, deplete your energy in a way in which you don't want to and is serving the spirit n n not at all if all your energy is being exhausted just working for the man and paying for the house and the car and the flat screen and all these sort of things you, you're vacuous you're empty, you're a husk and this is what Jesus would say, the dead, the spiritually dead. And so it's not everybody's bag. How many people want to relinquish all of these things that the modern world has to offer? How many people would want to relinquish copious amounts of sexual partners? Because every time we're flitting around with sexual partners, it's taking us further and further out of the kingdom of God. And so I can speak from a a platform and perspective of someone who's been to all these places. I've been heavily involved with all these things to a point whereby my ego imploded. I was I was just doing so much endless energy traveling all around the world meeting thousands of people hundreds of sexual encounters and all different sorts of scenarios where I will be compromised by life, situations and the human being and encountering negative drugs, cocaine, and cigarettes and alcohol. You know, there's beautiful drugs, entheogens. Entheogen means God within. They're called entheogens for a very good reason because God is within. I don't think God is in heroin or crack cocaine. It most certainly isn't in amphetamines, speed. And uh, it's not in alcohol. It's not in cigarettes. And eventually we'll, if we're wise, we'll learn these things. But you see, there's a saying that goes something like this. The world benefits from the devil being within it, as long as you keep your foot firmly upon his neck. Now you see, when we look at the devil being evil, the devil isn't per se evil. The devil is temptation. The devil is the portal into experiencing a great number of negative feelings and perpetrating negative actions. That's the choice that we've got with the polarities of good and evil. But you see, neither are explicit without the other. Because if there was no evil, there couldn't be any good. If there was no hate, there couldn't be any love. If there was no love, If there was no love, could there be hate? Well, there'd be nothing to compare it to, would there? So you need the polar opposite. You have to have the polar opposite to gauge between the two. Because if it's all one, then there isn't the other. You see, when I was, um, and, and of course, copious amounts of times when I've been taking DMT, it, DMT, the molecular structure, is almost identical to dopamine. 
And so you get a massive flush of dopamine where you feel absolutely wonderful. But also you become dissociated from the ego. So you've got two things going on. You become dissociated from the ego, which in itself is perfect because it takes you into the kingdom of God. But as soon as you come outside of the ego, you are instantly in the kingdom of God. Because there's no judgment, there's no fear, there's no pain, there's no suffering, uh, there's no biases, nothing. You are pure consciousness and you're in cosmic consciousness, unity with God. Um, and so the DMT, it flushes you filled with these chemicals which is a bodily experience, an egoic experience. But over and above that, it takes you into deeper and higher realms outside of the comprehension of the ego. The ego isn't welcome, there's no point in it being there. It couldn't comprehend anything because everything you see and feel is something that you've never felt before in your life. And so when you enter into this beautiful DMT world and you see the genius and the magic, then that also is one of the mansions in the kingdom of God. There are many mansions in God's kingdom. Mansions are states of consciousness. And we can get into many, many various states of consciousness by many, many different portals. And uh, when we enter into these states of consciousness, we enter into these kingdoms, then we experience something which is very, very profound. And so all the experiences I've had with heaven and hell, they have brought me to a position and time in my life whereby I've traveled both those roads and now I am heading up the graphic equalizer towards the polarity of love and away from that of fear and hate and evil and so in our lives when we engage with deception and maybe hate and violence and cruelty and we may speak untruths about people we may tell them terrible things what we think about them or project onto them. All these things, they don't do anything for the beautiful state of our consciousness. But they show us how it feels. And so we have to do it. It appears that we have to have Satan in the world. But as long as we keep one foot firmly upon his neck. And the more evolved you become, the stronger your resilience, fortitude. Whatever it takes to always be conscious, always be aware that you do, in actual fact, have the devil beneath your foot. And if you take your mind off of that if you become too complacent and the devil becomes free again then you will find in no time that he will make manifest in any number of way which will destroy all of the work that you've been doing and take you straight back into his realm and his realm is a troubled mind an unsettled body, fear, pain, suffering, hate, anxiety, disillusionment, all of the negative connotations what we can experience with the full spectrum of being a human being. And so it really is, you know, a battle but it doesn't have to be you know axes and swords and shields it can just be a battle of the wits it can just be a heightened state of awareness and
is the thing with language. You've got to look for all these words that mean what you feel. You see, I can feel what I want to say. And I have to be very, very careful and selective about the words I use. And then when you have a certain emotion that you want to offer, you have to have the word that is entirely befitting to it. And now if I was Russell Brand, I would find numerous words which would do the job. But these words don't come to my mind anything like as quickly as they do with him. But to always be aware, always be on the watch, always be heading towards, you always have to be heading towards. You can't be complacent that you've got it, you've worked it all out and you don't have to do anything else now. No, because if you do that you'll take your foot off the neck of the devil. So you have to be constantly aware, constantly seeking God. And you see, this is why, uh, you know, religious people are encouraged to constantly count their prayer beads, constantly read the scripture, constantly pray, constantly meditate, constantly give thanks to God, constantly, 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 constantly. Why? Because when you are tunnel vision through love and benevolence and all those sort of things, it's less likely that the devil will come creeping in. But if you are not always concentrating on the good and you leave yourself open to potential, then you know who's going to be there. Without a doubt, you know who's going to be there. And so this is why monks go to monasteries, nuns go to nunneries, gurus go to caves, and people like Jesus and the like go into the wilderness to regroup, to take that time to ask themselves what is real to them, what is settled, what is in their hearts, and to assess spirits all around them which are attempting to lure them in any which way. Ah, so, look, you see where I am. I've been here now three and a half hours. And I was in such a meditative state that I couldn't even think if I wanted to for a couple of hours of it. I read this Second Coming of Christ for about an hour. Laid down, having a little dose about half an hour. And then made this video, which is for half an hour. And just walking around this space, this Garden of Eden, what's similar to this place and the notion of the Garden of Eden? Well, there's a house of God next door or the Garden of Eden is in the grounds, within the wall. You see, the Garden of Eden, paradise, paradise apparently means walled garden. So when Muslims say they're going to paradise, they're going to the Garden of Eden, they're going to a walled garden. And so, well, this is a walled garden with a house of God within it. And then we have all these wonderful trees and all the nature all around and the sun is basking down and my bare feet are in the soft cool grass and I'm being energized. The human resonance of 7.8 hertz is passing through my body and I've done a little stretching and did a little yoga and I've gone a little bit euphoric and I, I, I've gone dizzy and I've seen D DMT-esque visions. You see, when we are doing yoga and we're bending down and we're coming back up again and we're stretching the body out in nature with a bare feet on the ground, something happens, people. Something happens. And when I am here, I have to stand absolutely erect 
I have to tense all the muscles in my body and I pull my feet on the ground and I feel my connectedness to Mother Earth. There is no separation and the energy is passing through. It's coming down from the sun, down into the centre of the earth and it's coming back round again and it's coming back down. And so this is the chi, people. Japanese people call it chi. Some people, like me, I consider it the, the natural energy of the universe, the cosmos, Earth, the human residence, 7.8 hertz. And once we get into that rhythm up on, our whole body vibrates in the kingdom of God. And if you do that for 10, 15, 20 minutes, you'll become drunk with that. Just keep doing the hum. And the vibration stimulates your heart into the essence of the cosmos. See, there's a lot of things to learn about this world, people. And just finally now with this video, the 60 of you now have purchased Closer to God. My book for anybody that's new that's looking in. I wrote a book called Closer to God and it's on Amazon. I'll put the link down below. But I speak about all these things in the book and my reservation my again I'm lost for the word I know what the word is I can't I can't express it but let me try and explain what I mean there are many things that I have done in my life and I explained how I've reached a certain something. And if the reader only reads the words and doesn't actually do the work, then they will never feel or take anything which is remotely powerful from those words. It's like if you read how to meditate and don't do it, you will gain absolutely nothing because the essence of meditation is in the participation. If you, I speak about the power of prayer, if you don't try prayer yourself, you will never know. I speak about investigating the power of faith, really, really investigating what faith was and trying to have it with all my heart to see if I could feel what that meant. Then, confessing before God, to actually see if the veracity of Catholic confessions is something. And so, yoga, do yoga. If you don't do yoga, I'm speaking about yoga, I'm speaking about exercising the body to the point of pure exhaustion. And when you get super, super fit, your body enters the kingdom of God because it's vibrating at the Schumann resonance and you're in contact with the cosmos. And there is nothing within your body um, which is preventing you from feeling that. You, you're not out of breath, you're not tired, you're not weak. Your whole body is doing exactly what it's supposed to do as a perfect human being. And so when you're doing that under the sun, magic happens, people. So you will read things, accounts about what I'm saying, and maybe you're too old, you're too infirm, you're too overweight, uh, you're too out of shape, all these things. You will never enter the kingdom of God like that. When I'm speaking about entheogens, if you're too afraid to take them, or if you don't have the facility, you will never enter the kingdom of God like that. If you don't meditate day in, day out, year in, year out, you will never enter into the kingdom of God. There's a whole million things. The book is called Closer to God because it's a how to get closer to God book. I show you explicitly, absolutely honestly, how I've done these things, good and bad. And I speak about encountering what I could only assume was the devil for a long time. Then I speak about encountering Jehovah and Jesus and the angels. How? How did I get to them? How did I make them manifest? How did I put myself into a position whereby they would manifest? I speak to you about these things. And yet, if you don't do them, 
if you don't pay them any mind, if you don't give them the greatest of thoughts, they will mean nothing to you. And so, it's like all things in life, there is the, the superficial knowledge of things, but the real knowledge is personal experience. And to have the superficial knowledge is a wonderful thing, don't get me wrong. If you've got knowledge of many, many, many myriad of other people and things, well, that's wonderful. And then when you have experiences, you have so much to call upon. And you see what these varieties of experiences are, mean, and how they come about, and all these different sorts of things. And so, experience. You see, if we are a sort of person that is filled with fear, how do we suppose that we are going to enter into the kingdom of God? If all the fears that we have are going to prevent us from taking that giant leap of faith, all my life I've been running around the world, I've been doing everything and anything because I've been wanting to feel what it's like and what that brings about emotionally, spiritually, humanistically and I've felt many, many things and they have constituted a spiritual mountain. I've got so much experience to call upon and being very versed then in study with all these things, then I have as much as anyone could have. And of course the whole psychedelic excursions is exceedingly important. And if anybody discounts the benefit of entheogens in union with God, let me tell you again, for all of you people, um, the odd Christian, oh, I don't need God, uh, drugs to get to God, uh, drugs are the devil. No, no, no. That's why they're called entheogens and have been, been called entheogens for thousands of years. Because when you take those, you enter into the kingdom of God. You will never, ever, ever get into the kingdom of God by reading scripture and prayer. It just isn't the way, unfortunately, for you. And I say it, and I say it, and I say it, because it needs saying, I'm compelled to say it. It's one of the messages that I'm bringing to the world. There are ways to enter into the kingdom of God. And I spoke about them recently, only a few days ago, maybe even yesterday, in one video. Five main ways you can get into the kingdom of God, and to know that it's really a thing. And reading the Bible isn't one of them. And the thing is, like, nobody will ever say that it is. I've never ever heard one of these Christian scholars tell you that you can enter into the kingdom of God. No, they all say the kingdom of God is out there. It's inaccessible to you here, even contrary to many, many of the teachings of Jesus, where he says the kingdom of God is within you and all that I can do, you can do more. And, you know, it's the spirit, it's cosmic consciousness, it's, it's God consciousness and all that. And we're all in it, we all bask within it, we all share it. But the churches don't want you to believe that or think that. And that's why they've omitted so much from out of those scriptures. But if you read the book of Thomas, you'll get a whole lot closer to the truth, people. The book of Thomas... I dare you, Christians. Oh, it's not in the Bible, it's evil. It's Gnostic writings. It's Jesus' words. And you can see that if there was any truth in the words of Jesus, then they are most certainly crying out, ringing out, in those 114 verses in the book of Thomas. So you might just want to start studying that and see how you feel about that. How you might start to consider that the Bible isn't, in actual fact, telling you the truth. Anyway, enough of that. I suppose most of my viewers are sick of that. But this is the journey I'm on, people. I've been on it for 14 years. I didn't always speak so profoundly and mono mono monotonously about such things, but I wasn't as evolved then. 
now much more evolved and so all of the focus oh, 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 my thoughts and my energies are focused much more into thinking about God always be thinking about God feeling God praying God speaking with God feeling whatever and that's what I'm doing and what can I say about my life it's never been more perfect what can we say about that I've never been more content more at peace more accomplished all those videos I made in the early days meant nothing they mean nothing all those things I was doing doubtless there was a purpose to my journey otherwise I wouldn't have travelled those paths but what do they mean now? who knows anyway people I'm going to do some fire breathing now I'm going to go out on my cycle, eight miles out in the countryside. And for the duration, it takes about half an hour, I'm going to be doing fire breathing, which is... <laughs> the whole way round, which absolutely flushes every cell in your body with oxygen. And so, if ever you're going to have an encounter with God, it's going to be in times like that. And one time, about two years ago, I had one of these such occasions. And when you have them, I'm telling you, it is just the most exquisite, wonderful, beautiful thing that you could ever have. Because you, you fully enter into the kingdom of God. When the world about you it has a stillness, an absolute stillness. Only everything's moving just as it always does. What is it that's still? It's the ego that's gone offline. The ego isn't there no more. What is there? God consciousness. You are in God consciousness. Unadulterated, pure God consciousness. And you know that there is something that loves you, absolutely loves you. And all this wonderful, beautiful stuff is for us. And if I've ever met God, then that was most certainly an occasion.